this is a story first and foremost about people, the people, the curators and art historians that affected this extraordinary act of conservation of China's imperial art collections during the Second World War. It's also a story about the art itself and the role that the art of China has played in Chinese society. But above all, it's a story about the transformations that have taken place in China, that took place through the 20th century. The transformation from empire to republic into total war, and then through to civil war and communist revolution. And particularly in the book, I hope uh, um, what only what I've really tried to draw out is in China in the Second World War. This, I think, is something that we in the English speaking world have sort of memory hold. We've forgotten all about it. We, we don't discuss the war in China. And in our popular representations of the Second World War, and even many of our scholarly representations of World War II, the war in China is not taken into account. It's not really taught. It's in some way sort of separated out and delineated and made to be, it's referred to as the Second Sino-Japanese War uh, frequently. And, and the sense of connection and, and kind of the, the integral role that the war in China played in World War II is not examined. So I'm hoping that uh, this story in this book will invite the reader just to kind of reconsider the scale and the scope of the Second World War and what happened in China. So let's start here. Does anybody know what that structure is? Anybody tell me what that is? That is the Meridian Gate. That's the southern entrance to the Forbidden City. In Peking, or Beijing, as we call it today, uh, in the center of the city lie the imperial precincts, the imperial city, uh, surrounded by those huge vermilion red walls. And then in the middle of the imperial city lies the Forbidden City, the Zijincheng. Uh, the Forbidden City is where, through the empires of the Ming and the Qing from the 1400s onwards, the emperors lived and their households and their immediate court, and only the emperors and their, and their households were per permitted to live and move freely inside the Forbidden City. This photograph was taken in 1900. Uh, look at the state of the walls. The place was in terrible shape. Look at the weeds. Uh, look at the kind of chunks falling out of the balustrades and the tiles falling off the roofs. The whole place is falling apart. This array of palaces and courtyards and gardens and alleyways is really in ghastly condition. The last emperor of China is still in there in 1912 when the Qing Empire uh, collapses and the Republic of China is born. The fragile, delicate Republic of China ruled mostly by warlords and regional strongmen. The last emperor Puyi stays in there and so stays the vast collection of imperial art. Behind these walls, there is this colossal collection of objects and texts. They are unseen. The public never sees them. They are for the eyes of the emperor and his immediate family only. There are paintings, porcelain, jades, bronzes, thrones, clocks, tapestries, jewels, books, encyclopedias, and entire archives. There's a huge variety of objects, and these objects play very different roles. Some of them are decorative. Uh, many of them are ritual. They're for use in Con Confucian and Taoist and Buddhist ritual. And some are functional. A lot of the porcelain is actually used for eating off. Deeply, it, these objects are all deeply intertwined with the imperial majesty and the imperial mystique. And they're entwined with the secrecy and the hiddenness that surrounds the emperor. They're a little like, uh, somebody compared them to the crown jewels of England. They're not just any jewels, they're the crown jewels of England. And these were the imperial art collections. They're kind of coated in specific meanings and associations. After 1912 and the collapse of the Qing, Pu Yi is allowed to stay on under agreement with the new Republican government. Much of the art at this time starts to go missing. Pu Yi himself writes that stuff, art is being sold and, and taken out of the Forbidden City uh, uh, to keep up with palace expenses. 
Fast forward to November 1924. Puni is with his wife, the Empress Wan Rong, in the imperial apartments inside the Forbidden City, chatting and eating fruit. Troops of the warlord from Yuxiang burst in and order Puyi to leave the Forbidden City forever, which he does. The palaces are now empty, closed, silent, shut down. The art is still sitting there in the dark, silent halls. Rumors spread through Peking that the warlord from Yuxiang is going to pack up the imperial collections, cart them off on camel trains, and sell them off to foreigners. Peking is absolutely buzzing with rumors. In fact, he doesn't do anything of the sort. He does the exact opposite. His new cabinet appoints what's called the Qing Shi Shan Hou Wei Yuan Hui, translated normally as the Committee for the Disposition of the Qing Household. 15 people who take responsibility for all the old imperial possessions, the palaces and everything inside them. The first task of the committee is to establish exactly what lies inside the Forbidden City. And in December 1924, teams go into the freezing, dark, silent halls and palaces, and they begin the huge task of cataloging and counting everything that lies inside. That gives you a glimpse of what that process was like. Those are inventory teams in the mid 1920s going through archives sorting through these mounds, vast piles of disordered documents. Who were the people on the inventory teams? Mostly they were professors and students from Peking University. They were academics who understood what it was they would be looking at inside the palaces, what the art was, and they could identify it. And above all, they could be trusted not to steal it. Most importantly for our story is this guy. His name is Ma Hung. He was born in 1881, just outside Shanghai in Baoshan. Uh, his father was a Qing magistrate, an official of the Qing uh, bureaucracy. He was an excellent student from a young age, fascinated by classical Chinese learning in the antiquarian tradition. He was fascinated by ancient inscriptions, by classical texts. He learned seal cutting and calligraphy from a young age. And he collected from a young age, too. He always yearned to be a true scholar in the traditional style, known in Chinese as Jin Shu Xue, sometimes translated as the antiquarian style. But in 1902, he marries into a very, very rich Shanghainese family. Uh, they own hardware stores, banks. Uh, and factories. And he becomes a businessman. And he's fantastically wealthy. And he lives this gilded life in Shanghai and lives in the foreign concessions, the French concession of Shanghai. He becomes an equestrian. His family owns a racetrack. He lives a wonderful, wealthy life in modernizing, exciting Shanghai. But throughout this, this reticent, rather retiring, very meticulous man yearns to be a scholar. And in 1917, he changes his life. He leaves Shanghai, he leaves his gilded existence, he moves to Peking, and he takes up a position at Peking University, which is expanding rapidly at this point under its legendary dean, Tsai Yuanpei. And in 1924, he joins the inventory teams that go into the Forbidden City to chart and catalog and identify all the art that is in there. What did he find? Well, he found paintings like this one that I focus on a little bit in the book. Uh, very dark, hard to make out. It's been damaged by light exposure over a thousand years. It's ink on silk. It was painted by a painter called Zhao Gan in the five uh, dynasties, 10 kingdoms period in the 10th century. Uh, it's an extraordinary hand scroll that is an incredibly detailed and very beautiful and kind of loving, humane examination of the life of fishermen on the waterways of the Jiangnan region outside what contemporary Shanghai, what we call Shanghai today. A beautifully closely observed landscape with these extraordinary depictions of particularly the fishing apparatus. Very, very deep insight into the way that people lived in uh, pre-Song period China. 
he found paintings like this one very different. No, uh, no human presence here at all, a pure nature painting from about the same time, about a thousand years ago, but this was painted in the Liao Empire to the north, uh, run by the, 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 the Kitan people. Uh, fabulous study of deer in an autumn forest, artist unknown, probably originally a, a screen, uh, but now a hanging scroll. Um, extraordinary anatomical depiction of these deer, again, minutely closely observed, all brush and ink on silk, fabulous control of, of, of the, the court painter's technique. He found porcelain, mountains of porcelain, like this. This is a ewer from the Shrendo period of the Ming. And what's uh, remarkable about this is not just the gorgeous form, but it's the glaze. This red glaze is made with copper. And they only figured out how to make these copper glazes for a period of about 20 years in the Ming. And it's incredibly difficult to get this deep complex red. Uh, you have to fire the piece in oxidation where there's no oxygen inside the kiln at very high temperature. And for every successful uh, piece where they managed to get this red glaze to come out, there would have been hundreds, perhaps thousands of failures that were thrown away and smashed. These glazes are among the most highly prized in all Chinese porcelain, and they are vanishingly rare, and now on, on the international market, worth astronomical amounts of money. It's very important to understand that Ma Hung and the people who went into the Forbidden City in 1924 had uh, found these collections and this art. Uh, this art had never been seen before. So as they went in and they started cataloging, these inventory teams were, were not just counting and identifying, they were building out a preliminary understanding of a vast hidden artistic and intellectual inheritance. One of the curators on the teams, Zhuang Yan, wrote that the cold in the palaces and the dark, the cold was intense, they were all freezing. The stoves were unlit and it was a Beijing winter, you know, bitterly, bitterly cold. But what drove everybody on was the pure joy and fascination of being the first to find out how life in the imperial court had been lived, what it was really like. Here's Ma Hung again in a beautiful portrait drawn by the artist Xu Bei Hong. Um, Ma Hung plays an important role the following year in 1925 in the establishment of the Palace Museum the Gugong, which takes charge of all the art collections in the Forbidden City and takes over the Forbidden City and makes it into a museum. In the minds of the new Chinese Republic, this will rival the Louvre in Paris and the British Museum as one of the world's great repositories of culture. By the late 1920s, Ma Hung is in his 40s. He's a su successful scholar. It's a post at Peking University and a post in the Palace Museum. The museum is as, as close to flourishing as it will ever really be. By this time, the antiquities within the museum have undergone a transformation. They are no longer the private secret horde of emperors. They've become national objects. They're called guobao, national treasures, or perhaps even state treasures. You could, you could translate, translate that to state treasures. They've become the property of a young, fragile nation state. And their role is no longer to delight the emperor, it's to educate a public, and I think to generate a sense of national identity, and for the first time in China, the sense of a shared national history, which has never really existed before. And now the story completely changes. 1931, Japan occupies Northeast China, Manchuria. Two, Japan attacks Shanghai. Vicious fighting breaks out between the Japanese military and Chinese forces in Shanghai. That's a very famous image of Chinese forces defending Shanghai. The Japanese bomb Shanghai. And what we have here is uh, a new kind of warfare, urban warfare being fought in the streets, aerial terror bombing of a civilian population. In other words, what we have in Shanghai in 1932 is a prefiguring of global conflict. It's a prefiguring of World War II. And the military attaches at the time who were in Shanghai saw that, they knew it. And they reported back to their capitals in Europe, 
when the next global conflict comes, look at this because this is what it's going to look like. Crucially, during the Battle of Shanghai in 1932, the Japanese bomb a building called the Commercial Press Building and attached to it, the Oriental Library. Commercial Press was a very important educational publisher. It published 75% of all educational texts in China. The Oriental Library next to it held a huge collection of source texts, valuable rare books, as well as many paintings and objects. All of it was destroyed. And for the first time, people realized that air raids, this new phenomenon of the air raid, wasn't just going to kill people and burn cities, it was going to destroy culture, it was going to eviscerate culture. 1933, the Japanese move out of their positions in Northeast China and Manchuria, and they start moving south. They move down to the Great Wall. They take Rohe province, and they take the city of Shanghai, Shanghai Guan on the coast. They now are in a position to control all of Northern China, and they're only about four hours away from Peking, from the Forbidden City by road. At some point, I think in 1932, it was difficult to pin down, the Palace Museum decides that if it is to preserve the imperial collections, the 1.17 million objects that they found inside the Forbidden City, they're going to have to pack the whole up and evacuate them, to take them out of the Forbidden City for the first time in six centuries. Absolutely central to the endeavor of packing the imperial collections uh, is the process of packing. The museum bought in thousands of old wooden crates that had been used to uh, pack cigarettes originally, found them grossly inadequate, had to throw them all away, and started buying in purpose-built wooden crates. They bought in cotton wo uh, wadding, they bought in heavy, thick paper, and they bought in hemp cord and vast quantities of rice husks and rice straw. And after several false starts, they start packing. There's one of the cases. This is one of the only photographs we have of this process. These are early bronze wine jars from the Han Dynasty 2000 years ago. And here you can see museum curators and soldiers starting to pack these cases. Mahon, there are four, there are four departments in the museum. Ma Hung is in the antiquities department, and his department alone packs 63,000 items, 28,000 pieces of porcelain, 8,000 paintings, 8,000 works in jade. Across the entire museum and in a few other museums around Peking, 19,557 of these cases are packed. The evacuation gets underway in early 1933. Here are hundreds of cases strewn across the courtyards of the Forbidden City awaiting evacuation. These cases were taken to the railway station, they were put on rolling stock, and they were taken out of Peking south in a deeply disorganized and chaotic effort, strangely, to Shanghai. Weird decision, right? Why would you do that given Shanghai has just been bombed? But the rationale was that the cases will be safest if they are stored in the foreign concessions in Shanghai, those parts of Shanghai that are controlled mostly by Britain and France, that have extra territoriality that the Japanese, it's believed, will not attack. The 20,000 cases start piling up in Shanghai uh, through 1933. They're stored in a disused hospital in the French concession on the Rue Montauban. Ma Hung, who by now is director of the Palace Museum, reluctantly, decides that there must be permanent storage. The central government is persuaded and they start building permanent warehouses in the capital of the Republic, Nanjing, just up the Yangtze River. They build permanent storehouses, a bomb-proof bunker underground with air conditioning and a huge steel door that kind of looked like a, one of those bank vault doors. Uh, the latest technology, it was, a, it was a top of the line storehouse facility. And by late 1936, all the art, 20,000 cases has now moved from Shanghai to Nanjing and is installed in these modern warehouses in Nanjing. And there everybody hopes it'll be safe for the duration. 
But of course it won't. Because in the summer of 1937, all out between uh, the Republic of China and Japan, uh, the Japanese land north and south of Shanghai, they take Shanghai and they start their drive inland from Shanghai up the Yangtze River Valley towards Nanjing. As the Japanese approach the walls of Nanjing in November 1937, 20,000 cases of the imperial collections remain in their storehouses in Nanjing. The Palace Museum is in a state of absolute panic. They have to move 20,000 cases out of Nanjing to prevent them falling into the, the hands of the Japanese, and they have only weeks to do it. They commandeer trucks, they hire hundreds of porters, they take over locomotives and rolling stock, and crucially, they hire steamships on the Yangtze River from British, the British company Butterfield and Swire, with the help of the British government. In late November 1937, porters begin loading the cases aboard trains and Yangtze River steamers day and night. Japanese bombers are pounding the city. Uh, Nanjing is in flames. The docks are overwhelmed with refugees. It's an awful moment. But the curators managed to get 17,000 cases out of Nanjing. The last cases leave Nanjing just 10 days before the Japanese take the city with all that is to follow. Now, this huge journey really gets underway. The 20,000 cases containing the Imperial collections are here in Nanjing, and they leave at the end of November 1937, just as the Japanese are approaching. At this point, something like 100 million people are on the move. It's one of the largest migrations in human history. Vast numbers of people flee Western China before move, I'm sorry, flee Eastern China and move to the far West, to sanctuary out here in Sichuan. The Republican government moves, the ministries move, the military moves, factories move, whole universities move, schools move. It's the most extraordinary migration. And the movement of the imperial collections mirrors that much, much larger migration. The imperial collections go by three routes. The first is the southern route, which goes from Nanjing up the Yangtze River by steamship, then south by truck for some reason all the way down here into Guangxi province, and then up to the province of Guizhou here. This takes nearly a year. And they end up here at Anshun in a cave that Ma Hung has found that's dry enough and big enough and remote enough that he thinks at least some of the imperial collections will be safe. However, this is only 80 cases containing some of the rarest and most extraordinary pieces. The second route is the largest, and it goes by steam, the central route, goes by steamship the whole way up the Yangtze River to Yichang, and then up the Three Gorges through these deep, deep defiles with rapids and shoals and sandbars where the boats carrying the imperial collections often have to be pulled physically by trackers on the bank using ropes, hauled upstream over this extraordinary crashing uh, torrents. Uh, they arrive in uh, Chongqing, the wartime capital of China, but then Chongqing is bombed by the Japanese. The Japanese have developed these long range bombers and they can hit Chongqing and Chongqing is mercilessly bombed. So they have to move again. So they go further, further up river and then they get stuck because the river is now sh so shallow during the summer of 1939 that they can't move any further. They have to wait for the water levels to, rive, to rise. So they're stuck in leaky, damp, temporary storage here at Ibin for months and months and months. And then they get rafted and taken up the Min River to Lershan. And 
9,361 cases arrive here, just outside Lershan, a little place called Angu, in September 1939, a year and a half after they leave Nanjing. Here they stay for the next seven years with a curator named Ouyang Daoda in charge of them. The last route was the northern route by train, north again, back the way they came, and then by train far, far, far to the west out to Shanxi province, to Baoji, where they ran out of railway line and were stored in a temple. The Japanese begin advancing along this axis following the railway line, so they have to move these cases again, seven and a half thousand cases. But there's nowhere for them to go by train, so they have to go by truck. And the only place for them to go is south, down into Sichuan. And to do that, they have to go over the Qinling Mountains, which is the highest mountain range in China outside Xinjiang and Tibet. It goes up to 12,000 feet. And this is the winter of 1938-39. And the trucks are skidding and sliding over the road with thousand foot drops. They're turning, overturning on the ice. The cases are falling out, <laughs> crashing to the ground. The trucks are getting stranded in snow drifts. The drivers are freezing and running out of food. It was absolutely miserable. As they come down here, all the bridges are out. They've been bombed by the Japanese. And there are a lot, a lot of rivers and waterways here. So when they arrive at these rivers, these cases, uh, these trucks carrying uh, 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 7,500 cases have to get rafted across the rivers. So the trucks have to nose up to the riverbank, these muddy rivers. They drive onto these bamboo rafts, and then they are poled across the rivers. And apart from the danger of the raft overturning and, and losing these cases containing the imperial art collections, it's just an incredibly slow process. This journey, this miserable journey, takes them nearly two years. When they arrive just outside the city of Erme here at the foot of Erme Shan, the sacred Buddhist mountain. They're installed in a series of um, temples and ancestral halls and, and quiet parts of town uh, in the hope that this is so remote and so far off the beaten track. Uh, Erme at this time didn't even have any running water or electricity in the hope that Japanese bombers would not, would not find them. And there they stayed seven years under the uh, uh, the eye of a curator named Na Zhi Liang, who wrote one of the most wonderful atmosphere, atmospheric memoirs of this whole time. Uh, and he figures as one of the chief characters in my book. Wonderful, hard-headed, very funny, resilient. During this period, an awful lot happens. It's crisis after crisis, improvisation after improvisation. I go into some detail in the book about how uh, many of these episodes that just give a sense of how complex and demanding and draining and terrifying the whole voyage was for the curators involved. Japanese bombing was ubiquitous. It was everywhere all the time. Disease was a huge concern. This massive migration uh, led to epidemics of waterborne disease, diarrhea, cholera, typhoid, typhoid, all the way up the Yangtze River Valley. Um, corruption was a huge issue. Venal steamship owners and truck owners ripping off the Palace Museum for all they could. Wartime profiteering, corrupt military officers, scammers, con artists. Our curators, Ma Hung and his guys, have to deal with, with all of this. And their one constant is fear. Not just fear of bombing and a violent death, but fear of failure. They are terrified that they'll lose this stuff that they've been entrusted with or it'll get lost or damaged or broken. And we can, we'll talk about that a bit. And they know that if they do lose it, they'll be blamed. And the fear of shame and the fear of disgrace was at the forefront of their minds all the time. By the end of 1939, the cases are as safe as Ma Hung thinks they can be out in West China. Ma Hung himself runs the Palace Museum from the wartime capital, Chongqing, where he endures terrible bombing. His wife and his fabulously wealthy relatives have all stayed in Shanghai. He never sees his wife again, and she dies in 1940. 
Elsewhere out in the storage sites, the curators have to conserve the art. They must take out the books and the paintings and air them, otherwise they'll get damp and moldy and rot. They have to fight a plague of bugs, termites, moths, insects. They spend much of the wartime years on their hands and knees, crawling around, inspecting the cases for signs of termite infestation. They spread coal and lime all over the floor. Termites terrify them. Termites will chomp into the, these cases and they'll just eat. They'll eat everything. Termites can digest cellulose. So they will just eat the entire Qing archive, given half a chance. They are terrified of fire. They spend all their lives filling up buckets full of sand. They import new expensive fire extinguishers from Shanghai. What's very important at this stage, I, I, I was lucky enough to interview uh, the children, the child, uh, the son of one of these curators, uh, who, was, who gave me a first person, very uh, rich memory of what it was like to live uh, out here in Anshun with his father, the curator Zhuang Yen. A wonderful texture on what they ate and where they slept and how his father would take him up to inspect the cases and take out the paintings. And the curator Zhuang Yen would quiz his children on who painted this on this painting, what period does it come from? And as they were, as they were, had hung up these invaluable song landscapes to have them air in the breeze. Yeah. We get a real insight into wartime China from Ma Hung's reports at this time because he tells us about his costs, about the finances of the Forbidden City. And what we see from this is just how important inflation was in this story. Inflation was perhaps just as corrosive to Chiang Kai-shek's Republic of China as was the war. It destroyed his country from the inside. Ma Hung tells us, he, he, he tells the, the directors of the Palace Museum in, in his report writing, uh, that the cost of lamp oil that he uses in the lamps to to light the storage facilities uh, has risen uh, by a factor of 40 in under two years. The cost of stationery of paper has gone up by over 10 times. Food is extraordinarily expensive by now. Nobody can afford to eat. Anybody who's on a static salary, which includes all the museum curators and all the soldiers that are assigned to guard these places are in absolute penury. And the time is full of uh, accounts of soldiers and officials and people who work for government and teachers taking on second jobs as farmers, uh, as navvies on the roads, as water carriers, just in order to make, uh, um, uh, to have a salary paid in food or millet or rice. Inflation was absolutely central to the Chinese wartime experience. And we get a real sense of that uh, by looking at what happened to the Palace Museum during the war. Fast forward to August 1945. Japan surrenders to the Allies. World War II ends kind of in some sense, but if you look at East Asia, for the end of a war, there's still an awful lot of fighting going on. East Asia will continue to fight against imperialism and colonialism through to the early 1970s. And the last chapter of this story now begins. The more than 17,000 cases that are stored out in the west of China in Sichuan and Guizhou provinces now have to come the whole way back. They're brought back by truck and by raft and by porter to Chongqing. And from here, over the course of a year, they are taken in a huge naval landing craft the whole way up the Yangtze River, back to Nanjing. They're back in Nanjing in 1947. Back to those purpose-built warehouses, which the Japanese converted into a military hospital. And when the curators get back to their purpose-built storehouses, they find that uh, all the fittings have been ripped out, the air conditioning's been stolen, and on the walls, wounded Japanese soldiers have written things in blood. So there's Japanese writing all over the walls, which in, in blood on the walls of the storehouses. 
as they make this huge journey in reverse, the Republic of China is beginning to collapse and China is falling back into civil war. The Chinese Communist Party has done quite well out of World War II. It has built its strength uh, up here in the far northwest of China. It has uh, built an army nearly a million strong, a party with hundreds of thousands of well-disciplined members. And now the Communist Party is on the move. It's on the move up here in the Northeast. It begins to take Manchuria. Uh, and all over China, communist offensives begin. In 1948, the government of the Republic of China under Chiang Kai-shek decides that it must retreat, and it decides that it is going to retreat to Taiwan. Chiang Kai-shek orders his government and his military uh, to go with him. He takes with him most of China's gold bullion reserves, and he orders that the very finest pieces of the imperial art collections, he will also take with him with the Republican treat, retreat to Taiwan. The Palace Museum curators, our guys, Ma Hung, Na Jiliang, and Zhuang Yan, and the other people we've been following for the last 13 years, are ordered to begin selecting the very finest pieces from the imperial collections for evacuation to Taiwan. Ma Hung himself, director of the Palace Museum, stays in Peking. He refuses to go to Taiwan. He decides to stay and wait for the takeover by the communists. Why? Not entirely clear. A sense of duty, a sense of loyalty to the Forbidden City, perhaps, to the Palace Museum. He's knocking on in years now. Perhaps he's been told by the Communist Party that he and the Imperial Collections in the Forbidden City will be preserved, that they'll be okay when the Communists take power. His son, Ma Hung's son, is close to the Communist underground particularly to a man named Ye Jianyin, the great famous Chinese uh, communist general. So we think perhaps Ma Hong was told by the Communist Party, it's okay, stay, and we'll look after you. Everybody else is leaving for Taiwan. All the intelligentsia are going, the great archeologist Li Ji is taking all his stuff that he's dug up uh, from the great excavations of the 1930s, leaving for Taiwan. Uh, the great intellectuals like Hu Shi and, and, and Fu Sinyan, the people who've engineered this extraordinary transformation in, in, uh, among the Chinese intelligentsia, they're all going. They're all jumping on the final planes out of Peking and leaving for Taiwan. In late 1948, moored at the docks in Nanjing, waiting to go to Taiwan, is an LST, a tank landing ship, originally American, served in the US Navy during World War II, and it was given to the Republic of China at the end of the war. These tank landing ships were used by the Republic to retreat to Taiwan. This one, the Zhongding, is moored in Nanjing. There's chaos uh, on the docks in December 1948. Thousands of Republic of China military families are seeking passage to Taiwan. They're desperate to escape the advancing communists. They're swamping the ships. The cases of the imperial collections fight their way through these crowds and finally get loaded on the LST. And three shipments are taken to Taiwan. 2,972 cases containing what the curators of the time considered to be the most irreplaceable pieces of all of Chinese imperial art. 20,000 pieces of porcelain went 150,000 volumes of rare books, thousands of works in jade. The imperial collections, as they were constituted by the emperors of China, particularly Qianlong Emperor in the 18th century, uh, and as they were disposed inside the Forbidden City, are now split. They're split between Peking and Taiwan, and some of them remain in Nanjing as well. And they'll never be reconstituted in their original places in the Forbidden City. Those cases that went to Taiwan have now, of course, form the core of the marvelous Palace Museum Taipei, which is a just extraordinary uh, uh, museum. The final chapter of my book deals with the fate of our guy, Ma Hung, on the Chinese mainland in, in Peking, now renamed Beijing, when the communists take over. 
Uh, it's a difficult story. I'm not going to go into it now. Uh, uh, I think we're all pretty familiar with how intellectuals fared in the early years of the People's Republic of China, and Ma Hong is no exception. That ending to the book, it doesn't end well for the curators who decided to stay behind. It's a sort of bittersweet ending for the imperial collections because they did survive in Peking and in Taiwan, and they are now on display for everybody to see, and they are beautifully and wonderfully conserved in, in both capitals. So in its larger context, this is a story about the art and the people who saw the imperial art collections on this journey. It's also a story about nationhood and the way that a generation of Chinese people tried to engender a sense of nation through fostering the sense of national culture, through turning the imperial collections in the Forbidden City into a museum and of trying to build a sense of shared national identity and a shared national history. And I hope it's a story about the Second World War in China and an invitation to the reader to perhaps reconsider the scale and the scope of the Second World War, and perhaps to become a little bit more alert to the variety of stories and lived experience that constitute the Second World War. Thank you very much for listening. I'll leave it there.